So hello and welcome to our second webinar. This is with Ella Winnen Howard, who is a research fellow at Zinc and a PhD student in gerontology. Um, and first off, I am afraid I don't know very much about gerontology. Um, I do know a little bit about Zinc, um, our social mission incubator. But Ella, if you wouldn't mind, um, can you tell us how you think your parents would describe what you do for a living, please? Um, well, I asked my parents actually um, in anticipation of this, and they were both pretty accurate, which filled me with confidence. Um, they said that I was a researcher, I was a student, but also that I worked in Zinc to help advise and inform early stage startups to be more evidence based, which is essentially what I do through Zinc. So, Zinc runs a nine month program where 50 entrepreneurs come together to start up mission based um, impact driven startups and their current mission is all around adding five years of five high quality years to later life so trying to encourage or helping people live better for longer and to close that gap between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy and my background's all in gerontology. My PhD is on um, social isolation and well-being amongst older adults. And I did before that I did a master's in gerontology as well. So I came on board as a research fellow with Zinc right at the beginning of their mission um, to sort of, I guess, provide that age-related insight to their in-house R&D team alongside with a whole range of other expert fellows that Zinc collaborate with as well to help these startups navigate the world of, of healthy ageing. Sounds like a very hot topic right now. Yeah. <laughs> so um, can I ask why, why did you apply to be seconded to Zinc? Um, you know, it's, uh, lots of PhD students go through their, their PhD journey uh, and they, they carry out their research um, and then and they, at the end they might go into academia, they might go on to do other things, but uh, it's relatively unusual to, um, to go for a secondment um, part of the way through. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, why, why you decided to do that? I, I'd always wanted to do a placement or an internship or something like that when I started out with a PhD. Um, so my PhD is with the South Coast Doctoral Training Partnership mm -hmm. and they'd said that they, they do lots of internships and, and placements and that had really attracted me as an idea to see, I've always been curious about this connection between the research and academic world and the wider world, um, both in the the creation of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge, those pathways between the two. Um, but lots of the opportunities were in the third sector. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very passionate about older adults. And so I did something that was very much in that domain space. I didn't want to compromise what I was really passionate and interested in just to do a placement in anything. Um, and actually a friend of mine who I know from completely outside of university or work life um, happens to work in startups and came across Sync and introduced them to me. I hadn't, I didn't know really anything about startups, anything about incubators, hadn't heard of Zinc. Um, and he just knew that I was interested in ageing, which I think is relatively uncommon. <laughs> Someone is 27. Um, I was like, oh, I thought they might be really interested. I, I saw the opportunity and got involved and it just completely clicked and appealed to me. Mm. I spoke to um, Rachel Carey, who's the research manager there, and Paul Kirby, who's um, the CEO, and everything that they were talking about in terms of their approach to, to research, problem-led, um, iterative, impact-driven, collaborative, um, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, all of these things 
sort of a breath of fresh air, I guess, um, really resonated with some of the things that I had found less appealing um, in the academic context and just found it just seemed like an opportunity that I wouldn't have got elsewhere. It was a completely new world, um, a completely new approach to research, but very much in the domain area that I was passionate and interested about. So, um, yeah, I think I saw a bit of a hands off. Yeah, I suppose um, from my perspective, I suppose I see zinc as a kind of bridge um, between academia and um, and the kind of startup scene and the commercial world, because I suppose for me, zinc doesn't really fit neatly into a typical type of incubator. Um, and they are incredibly open about um, trying to create new links with different types of um, researchers. Uh, and I think that's that that can that's really exciting. I think that actually Zinc are, are providing a, a really vital function within the within the innovation landscape. Um, but also, I think different kinds of entrepreneurs. Yes, the classic understanding we have of an entrepreneur and the sorts of people who maybe would traditionally go into that um, career. Yeah. Um, are different to some of the people who apply to be part of Zinc. Um, so, for example, in this current mission, one of our founders was a former head of a CCG. And we have quite a few people from clinical backgrounds who've had whole careers working within different aspects of healthcare and have this huge volume of knowledge and insight to be able to apply to innovation in that space, but might not have some of the training or experience or confidence to start up a business mm -hmm. and i think zinc's really good at bringing those people together some of the more business-minded people some of the people with the, the real domain expertise and some of the creatives to think about new ways of innovating old practices um, whereas lots of yeah something the new types of entrepreneurs and it also allows for new types of research. Mm. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like um, there is one um, company that maybe um, really challenged you or helped you um, whilst you were at Zinc to really think about your own research or think about how you actually approach research in general, um, or that they've got a really exciting project that you think with your background um, feels really innovative and, and, and totally different to what you've seen before? Um, so I think one of the things which I found quite difficult in in academic in academia but in gerontology generally is that because it's a process of understanding problems um, and social gerontologists have pretty much since the conception of the discipline been trying to fight against age-based stereotypes right proving that the traditional characterizations of older adults as being vulnerable and um, I mean, we see that in the rhetoric around COVID that they're, they're unable to, you know, do anything that normal or normal younger people might be able to do. And social gerontologists have been disproving this for a long time. But it, that you en then end up with this narrative in which you have the ones who've aged well, and they're great, and then the ones who haven't aged well, and that's where the problem in need is. And so then that's where the research usually happens. So you have this sort of tension between saying not everybody's struggling in later life don't generalize but also these people are struggling and fund our research on these people because this is really this is bad which is fine but then you never follow that logic through to understanding how those people who are disadvantaged also can be the force and power and have the strength to have their own solutions to that so you never see the resilience or the ingenuity or the other things about that disadvantage. It's all about that, that problem and that need. Whereas switching it on its head in which you say, okay, where are these problems? Where is that disadvantage? But then also where is the solution allows for like, I think a much more positive and validating narrative. 
Mm -hmm. One of the companies um, who are called Diaspo, um, we're looking at BAME older adults and particularly about lost cultural heritage and a sense of identity. So lots of people talk about how in later life some of the social norms and roles that might give you a sense of purpose can change or shift. So you have a different role within your family, you maybe retire and you have a different role within the workplace. But for people who are second and third generation as well, you can find yourself maybe slightly disconnected from, particularly in a very multi-ethnic, multinational society. But the solution to that is that he has developed a food sharing platform in which older adults can share cooking practices from traditional um, recipes that they know and love with other younger people who really want to learn how to make authentic food. And so instead of having a narrative or a conversation around how the, the disadvantaged and the vulnerable have a problem or a need, you end up with a conversation about these hundreds of people who have this amazing untapped knowledge and skill and passion that they're then able to share. Mm. Some really nice moments talking to them, which I think allows for a really different sort of conversation. And I think those are the sorts of conversations that we need to have if we're really gonna shift that narrative away from the ageism, is to show those solutions, show how people can have the opportunity to change their lives and improve their lives and overcome these things. Um, yeah, and I guess how ventures can be a catalyst or an opportunity for them to allow to allow themselves to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think it, it you know it can. There's an opportunity to have a much more positive um, reframing of later life, which I find really exciting, and I think Diaspora has done that really well. Mm -hmm. So perhaps a more holistic idea of what of what EJ might look like. Yeah. Okay. And I suppose as a as a kind of um, a follow on to that, what do you? So there's a lot of uh, in in all walks of life. There are a lot of myths and misconceptions about um, lots of different types of groups of people, including ageism. Um, and I suppose one of the things that I'm wondering about is, um, can you tell us a little bit uh, about? Um, kind of myths or misconceptions that you have encountered because in a sense you're acting as like a mini bridge um, I called uh, Zinka kind of bridging the gap earlier but um, you're acting like a mini bridge in between academia and the and the commercial sector um, what do you think are kind of common myths and misconceptions um, that you've encountered along the way from both from both parties um. I think that I, I think it's, so lots of the entrepreneurs have academic backgrounds and um, that's one of the things that Zinc really encourages. Like I said, there's different sort of, it encourages different sorts of people to get into entrepreneurship. And one of that is that there's quite a few people who come out with PhDs to set up their businesses through Zinc. Um, so I think these misconceptions largely apply to those who maybe haven't encountered um, research or academia very much. Amongst them, generally found that there's sort of two, two polar sides. They, there's either this expectation that academics know everything all at once at, at the point. And, um, I think they miss that, you know, research being a methodology and being a way of uncovering knowledge and a way of applying critical thought to accepted knowledge rather than um, just being an encyclopedia of knowing everything about ageing on every topic, which is definitely not the case. Um, or on the other side of that saying, oh, well, research can't really tell you anything because you can just, you know, what is really significant, you can just make anything significant, it's not really that valuable. Um, and I think being able to sit down hands-on and show people what data we do have, 
what knowledge we do have, what, you know, from the body of literature, from secondary data, what we can understand and how they can access all those resources and tools and knowledge to learn about the topics that they're curious about, but also explain what, what academic, what research can't do has been almost just as useful. Mm -hmm. um, because then you can explain, of course, like how they might be able to fill in those gaps in their knowledge. And then when they go on to design pilots, after they've got um, a problem, they can go out and test some of that and collect their own data. And that I found that process really, really validating because then they sort, you know, have come back and found papers or been like, oh, I found this variable. Isn't this really exciting? Look, you can do this. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It's great. <laughs> and so I think they, yeah, it's almost, at this, it's like almost both, like a both overestimate, overestimation in what academia might be able to do and also an underestimate estimation but then by finding that line in between of what they can answer mm. the existing knowledge and how that they can help that, how that can help them um i th i don't think there's a founder that i've spoken to who hasn't found that incredibly useful and then you know come back with really enthusiastic responses about how it's shaped their thinking and how it will be useful for them going forward because obviously it is really useful right mm, yeah okay uh, that's really interesting actually um so if i could if i could remove every barrier uh money related covid related um every type of uh funding restriction uh, and i could wave my little magic wand and say to you ella here is your project what would that project be and would you want to be known by that project alone i so there's two there's two parts to that um the project would be something co-produced and directed and led by all the adults um, and something that had direct relevance to their lives. So I, I mean, any more than that, I don't know, but it would be something which came out of the older adults themselves from the users um, and they helped produce and then went right back into something for them. Um, I, the second part of that about whether I'd want to be known for it, I don't, I don't think I'd want to be known for any research really. Um, I think that sometimes in academia, the fact that you, you have a name so everyone has a name, but then that is so closely attached to your reputation and your research outputs can distort some of the incentives for producing research and knowledge. Um, I don't know that I think it disincentivizes people publishing null results, and I think it potentially doesn't incentivize collaboration. Um, and I think it makes people wary of trying new different things because you've got this sort of back catalogue of things by your reputation and your name. Um, I also think it reinforces a hierarchy within the wider industry in which people who've been around longer and therefore have more publications gain more kudos rather than people being assessed in a purely meritocratic way on their contribution maybe in terms of like in terms of the innovation or the quality of the research um and so i think that i would probably want yeah i mean i'd want the older adults who are involved in the research to feel that they had 
receive genuine benefit from being part of the process and also have benefited from the outputs from it rather than me be known for it necessarily because I think that ultimately the impact of our research on the participants that participate and on wider society should be the fundamental incentive rather than academic um, yeah sort of i don't know if that i feel like that's not really answering the question i'm sort of saying <laughs> sort of avoiding the question but um i think though that co-production piece is so important and it's such a it's such a pillar within the social sciences community um that what one of the things that i think that social scientists bring is that element of co-production and then what can then happen when you co-produce uh, pieces of innovation or pieces of research uh, or exciting new entrepreneurial ideas and i think that whole co-production piece really really matters um, and yeah, really is something that actually social scientists should almost shout more about in terms of of how social scientists approach the world so i think that co-production is really really important and almost the element of co-production could be foregrounded as opposed to the academic themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's what I'm trying to say. I think I see the research process as a way to provide a spotlight and a microphone on a, a group of people or a particular issue that is not often represented. Um, and a way of doing that ethically and sensitively and also robustly so that people can learn from those experiences and that those people feel valued and, and part of the wider change in society. Mm, mm. So the, the person, you know, the microphone in that, which is the researcher, is almost just a tool. They mm. should be the the critical piece. Okay, and I suppose this leads us nicely to our our sadly last question, um, which is around social science in general. And what do you wish the world at large knew about the social sciences that you think they don't already know? It's interesting, actually. Um, I had a few conversations about generally what people view how people view science particularly in the context of covid because it feels like we're at a point in which after a long a long time everyone talking about fake news suddenly science is back on the agenda again for better or worse probably for worse um as in i would i would prefer the circumstances be different <laughs> i think we would all prefer that yes Let, let's say it like that um but nevertheless lots of people are listening and talking to about and engaging with science and data in a way that hasn't been seen for a long time um i mean some of the statisticians at the ons have become rock stars <laughs> rock stars i think that i would like people to see that integration between the social world and the the natural world a bit more. I think that we become very accustomed to separating those um, just in our understanding of the world generally. Um, but you can't really understand any process without having that really multidisciplinary perspective. So like I seen the other day, one of the ventures that um, we've been supporting and working with is looking to improve the clinical diagnosis process for people with cognitive impairment leading towards some sort of dementia diagnosis. And that requires a whole body of evidence around the clinical medical side of it, what is actually going on inside people's brains and the, the psychology but also, and the technology, and there's a lot of data science in there as well, and maths, but also it's impossible to really understand that without understanding why people 
would first go to their clinician. And to understand that, we have to know, okay, what do people think of as a normal memory? Do people see age-related memory loss as a normal part of aging? And therefore they don't think that they would have a, con a condition and then they wouldn't go and get a diagnosis, which is often the case. Um, or do they view that differently? And lots of that comes back to the social right how we interact with our families and friends how we perceive different ideas of our own bodies and our experiences and all of that stuff and those are like to me almost impossible to separate and one of the things that's really lovely about sync is that you get these this opportunity to i guess explore those like pockets of social research or, or like types of experience in these really holistic manners. So you're looking at this process of dementia diagnosis and you're saying, okay, where is the social element of this? Where's the behavioral element of this? Where's the clinical diagnostic element of this? Where's the tech element of this? And pe piecing all of that together, which is so exciting. And I think something that lots of people at the world large don't appreciate because I think you know, there's this tendency to think of the natural sciences as the, the hardcore ones and the social scientists as being the sort of fluffy add-on. But really, if you don't get that social science piece right, often hard science just isn't that relevant. You know, the engineering of a technology for an innovation is critical to make it work, but if you don't have the behavioural science or the social science to get people to want to use it, then it's irrelevant. I think that is a very excellent place to end. Thank you so much uh, to yeah. Ella from Zinc for participating in our webinar today. If you have any questions for Zinc or for uh, the University of Glasgow or for Aspect, then please do get in touch. Thanks again to Ella. Thank you.